I was convinced that this insane man who watched me walk to school was going to kill me. As they described it, the police found his blog where he wrote about his obsession with one of the girls who live next door. Israel Keys, most known for murdering an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her body and dropping the pieces into a frozen lake. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. Recommended. Listener discretion advised. You're just moments away from true tales of terror that will leave you breathless. From Disturbed Media, I'm your host, Chad, and this is Disturbed. This episode is sponsored by Wondery's Generation Y podcast, where hosts and true crime fanatics Justin and Aaron explore hundreds of unsolved murders and conspiracy theories. If you're ready to kick your true crime obsession into overdrive, subscribe to Wondery's The Generation Y podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Welcome back in, everyone. Another week on as we continue to bring you those true scary stories. Now one quick order of business. If you have your own true personal experience you'd like to share for the show, you can do so over at disturbedpodcast.com slash submit. Just make sure you follow the guidelines. Now, let's get into it. Our first experience comes to us from Reddit user Debital, and it's here where we learn that maybe you shouldn't always answer the doorbell. Performing this experience is Nicole Doolin. At 12 years old, I was already riddled with PTSD and severe anxiety. Seeing a therapist twice a week did nothing to stop my extreme paranoia that someone was following me home from school, that someone may be watching me in my bedroom that someone may be trying to take me from my front yard. My mom raised three children by herself. My older brother was in high school, my younger brother in elementary, and I walked three blocks to the middle school just down the street from our house. Always the safe rather than sorry type of parent, my mom insisted that I walk with two other girls who lived on my street. As middle schoolers often do, we meandered on the way to school and cut through yards and parking lots, to spend most of the time gossiping. We often split through a church's parking lot if we were in a hurry, usually flush with cars in the morning and afternoon from the preschool in the back. It wasn't unusual to see the same cars every day on our way to school and again on our way back. The other girls thought nothing of it, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched on our trek home. In the winter months of my seventh grade year, we used our shortcut every day. The preschool was shut for renovations, so the icy parking lot was empty and perfect for throwing snowballs or sliding on patches of ice. Only a few cars regularly lingered in the front of the building, except one white pickup truck that was parked in the back. Every time I saw it, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Every morning and afternoon, a man would be sitting in the driver's seat of the truck, looking out the window, watching us walk. I told my mother the first time I saw him. Knowing I was prone to panic, she brushed it off and told me he must work at the church. The second time I brought it up, she gave me a pink canister of pepper spray and told me to use it first and apologize later. I gripped it in my cold hand every day after that when we passed the man in his truck. I described him to my mother in detail. A few weeks after we saw the truck for the first time, we crossed the lot after school and found it empty. I breathed a fresh breath, putting my pepper spray in my bag and kicking up powdery snow out of relief. That joy died when I turned down my street and saw the truck parked in a driveway just five houses down from mine. 
I sprinted home, locked the door behind me, and counted the minutes until my mother would come home from work. When she finally did, I barraged her with questions. Who was the man? Did he live there? What did she know? But my mom's answers were short and nondescriptive. As a single mother, she didn't mingle much with the neighbors and seldom had time to inquire about who lived where. She did know that the couple who owned the house where the pickup sat had a deranged son, who had been sent to a mental hospital after an incident when he was 14. I was filled with fear. I closed the curtains to my window before the sun had even set that night, and before I went to bed I locked every window and door in the house. I was convinced that this insane man who watched me walk to school was going to kill me. When I finally did fall asleep that night, I woke in the middle of the night to the sound of our doorbell being pressed repeatedly, almost as if someone was leaning on it. I looked across the hall and my mother was standing in her doorway, face white as a sheet. I scampered across the hall and held my little brother tightly as my mom went to the door. Without opening it, she shouted, Who are you? And... What do you want? There was no reply, only the sound of the doorbell. Through the people, she saw the man who drove the truck parked five houses down. She shouted, I'm calling the police! As she dialed 911 on her phone. The ringing stopped and was shortly replaced by banging, as if the man was trying to break the door down. Red and blue lights flooded our street and the man ran off through the streets. The police didn't chase him, Instead, they parked in our driveway. They asked my mother if she had told him to go away. Panicked and crying, she told them she hadn't. And they said there was nothing they could do. She asked to file a restraining order, but they said there was no way to know for sure it was the man down the street. I told them the license number of the truck that was parked in the church's lot, and that the man who drove it was the same man my mom saw ringing our bell. The police wrote it down, but didn't seem interested. After about 20 minutes of asking questions, they left and advised we lock our doors. My mother googled the last name of the couple down the street and found out that their son had been discharged at the same time that the truck started showing up in the parking lot. He had been arrested for raping two 12-year-old girls when he was 14 years old, and it was determined that he suffered from a mental disability. He was sentenced to serve 30 years in a mental hospital and then be put on parole. We moved. To this day, I am still convinced that he was trying to kidnap me that night. Let's not meet again. Special thanks to all of our newest Patreon members. Alphonse Littlejohn, Rachel Williams, Stacy Jenks, Lindsay, Kayla Clenny, Amanda Gale, and Vani. Support the show and get your very own shout-out, ad-free listening, bonus episodes, and more for as little as $3 a month by joining our Patreon at disturbedpodcast.com support. Next up, Reddit user Snarf Blatten Concert had an experience with a neighbor that turned out to be truly terrifying. Performing this experience is the host of the Already Gone podcast, Nina Instead. Stick around after the story for a short trailer for Nina's show. When I was 12, I started babysitting for family friends. They had three daughters between the ages of four and seven. This family, they lived on a cul-de-sac where almost every house had a young couple with children who were elementary school age. And the neighborhood was very close-knit, like 1950s block party community close-knit. They had a communal policy on using one another's toys. Any kid could use a play structure in someone else's yard at any time without asking. And not long after I started babysitting, they revised the rule to... Any time a family is not using a babysitter to watch their kids, this ensured that I wouldn't get overwhelmed supervising a swarm of children that I wasn't paid to watch. It wasn't hard to tell when parents were headed out and leaving someone else in charge of their children. But I was welcome to take the girls to play in any other yard as the girls wanted. 
The parents even gave me permission to let them play in someone else's yard or sandbox independently if I needed a short break. I was an avid babysitter's club reader, so I didn't leave the girls outside unsupervised, not ever. I would wait until someone else wanted a water or bathroom break and then corral the kids inside for a few minutes. Similarly, when the girls wanted to play in the treehouse owned by an older couple a few doors up the street, I climbed up with them, despite a slight fear of heights, and crouched in the little house with the girls, despite my feelings of claustrophobia, to follow my own rule. And I don't remember if the everyone inside, everyone outside together rule preceded the first odd interaction I had with the next door neighbor or not. But years later, when police questioned the girls I once babysat, they said nothing bad ever happened when I watched them because I set up that weird, sometimes annoying rule. One day, while playing basketball with the girls in the driveway, the next-door neighbor came outside in a baseball cap and sunglasses, and he sat down on his second-story deck to read a paperback. I later noticed he'd turned his chair around 180 degrees to face us and the basketball hoop. I couldn't tell if he was looking at us. He had no reaction to me staring at him. He flipped the pages in his book like someone would while reading. And this behavior, it repeated every time we played basketball for the five years I watched those girls. Eventually, once I noticed him in the chair, accessories on, I would suggest a game we could play inside or in the front yard, but out of his view. This strange neighbor, I knew him, sort of. He went to my church, and I have never seen someone kneel in a pew, head bowed, hands folded, with the same level of intensity before or since. Once, when my family was seated behind him, priest came over to ask me to lead the children's mass during the homily because the usual person was out sick. This guy, this strange neighbor, he turned around and glared at me like I personally set out to interrupt his prayer time. When I volunteered in the church nursery during various masses, I would often make eye contact with him as he waited in line outside the nursery door to use the restroom. From what I gleaned from family friends and other people in the neighborhood, this odd neighbor, the basketball observer, he was a nice guy who gave up his apartment and job in the city to move in and care for his sick elderly mother. Since everyone else thought he was great and kind, and since he went to church, and this was back before the sex scandal in the church broke, I figured I was in the wrong for finding him creepy. Even as young as 12, I was used to guys in their 40s and 50s asking me to go somewhere with them or driving by a little too slowly as I walked, biked, or jogged. They would make lewd comments, and I figured I was projecting those experiences onto this awkward, quiet man who really wasn't doing anything wrong. For instance, I was certain that if the guy next door was a creep, he would not miss the opportunity to watch with his sunglasses on and book in hand while the kids and I went swimming each summer when the family opened their above-ground pool. But I never saw him on the deck when the kids and I put on swimsuits to play in the pool or backyard. This made me convinced that I was in the wrong, that I was just being mean. Then, when I was 15 or 16, I caught him looking in the window as I cleaned up after movie night. The girls and I put on a film after bath time, and instead of watching it theater style with all the lights off, we kept some lights on so I could braid the girls' hair. The big screen TV we used for movies was located in an addition on the house, and the addition had floor to ceiling windows. While my own parents were always concerned about shutting blinds and curtains when the sun went down to prevent people from seeing in, the people I babysat for did not have treatments on the big modern windows in their home. So when I turned off the last light in the room, a floor lamp right next to a window facing the neighbor's house, I could suddenly see into the darkness outside, and I saw that weird man sitting on his deck in a chair, in line with the window I was looking through. Looking over my shoulder, I realized he had a line of sight on where the girls and I sat on the floor during the movie. Looking back toward the house, I glimpsed him hurrying back inside. And I wouldn't have seen him at all except he left his chair in an unusual spot. After watching him turn the chair around to read during many a basketball match, I knew where the chair sat that night, facing the window into the family room. That was not the chair's usual position on the deck. 
After that incident, I suggested playing board games in another room or suggested we watched movies theater style to ensure that he could not peep on what we were doing at night. After the girls went to sleep, I avoided the family room entirely. I was paranoid about being watched. If I wasn't in the kitchen doing homework or reading away from all the windows, I'd walk around the original first floor footprint of the house where the windows had curtains. The first time the parents noticed my change in routine, they insisted I could watch TV or movies in the family room. I didn't mention anything to them about the neighbor because I was worried that my concerns about him were silly and self-centered. When I was 17, my family heard an evening cable news story about a man in our town. He'd been caught in a police sting operation where a woman pretended to prostitute her two-year-old. When they raided his house, the police found a ton of child pornography on his computer. It was a few weeks later when our family friends called. They wanted to know how I knew the man next door to them was not safe because he was the guy I'd heard about on TV. As they described it, the police found his blog where he wrote about his obsession with one of the girls who lived next door. It detailed his fantasies involving her and his plans to act on those fantasies. He did things like lying in the treehouse for hours hoping to corner her when she climbed up alone to play. Many of his entries, they were focused on taking advantage of or kidnapping the girl while the babysitter was in charge. In his head, babysitters were like the ones in old movies talking to friends on the phone or making out with a boy they invited over instead of caring for those children. As it became clear that I did neither of those things, his plans evolved. Now he was going to kill the babysitter, take the girl, and get out of town. Police interviewed the girls to make sure that they were not victims. Then the police suggested that I must have known something to have acted the way I did. But it was all the pieces, the run-ins at church when I had children in my care, or the weird things he did when he knew I was watching the kids next door. It all fit together. I was relieved that I was not mean-spirited and I was not imagining things. Maybe I was conceited. The focus was not on me, but on the children. But listeners, I was not crazy. I recognized that I was not the person most at risk in this situation, and yet suburban pedo and would-be murderer? Let's not meet again. Oh, and pro tip, read books, The Gift of Fear, and the Babysitter's Club series. They help me. Maybe they'll help you. I'm Nina Instead, host of the Already Gone podcast. Join us on the 1st and 15th of each month for a look at lesser-known crimes from Michigan and the Great Lakes region. Learn more at www.alreadygonepodcast.com. Next up, we hear from Reddit user Meepit Askew about the time she was nearly abducted, but not by just anyone. Performing this experience is Sarah Thomas. In February of 2012, I went to visit my grandfather's grave for his birthday. His death was a really hard thing for me to deal with, as he had died in March of 2011, and was still very fresh to me. I was kneeling in front of his grave with my head down, mourning and crying, when my body went into full danger is close by mode. I looked up to see a man running full sprint from the woods surrounding the cemetery, and forced myself to get to my truck as quickly as possible without the man getting too close to me. By the time I made it to my truck, he had gotten about 50 feet from me. I jumped in and locked the door, much to his apparent displeasure. He threw his hands up in a huff like his favorite team had just lost a football game. I started the truck and started to drive out as fast as I could, but not before driving right past him. I didn't break eye contact for a second, and neither did he, so I got a really good look at his face. Cut to a few years later, I'm at work, bored, and decided to download an app that had a ton of paranormal, cryptid, serial killer, and UFO articles. As I was browsing through the serial killers, I came across one that made my heart drop into my ass. 
Israel Keys, most known for murdering an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her body and dropping the pieces into a frozen lake. He would bury kill kits in places long before he ever committed the crimes. After the incident in Alaska, he had traveled into Texas for a wedding in a city not too far from where I live and had disappeared for a bit and no one in his family knew where he was. He was arrested in that city and brought to the prison one city over from me before he was extradited back to Alaska to stand trial. About a year ago, I found a book on him that proved a lot of the details I have given here. He had been killing for years and no one knows what the actual death toll is. He eventually killed himself in prison. At the end of the book about him, he describes some of his favorite places to abduct people, public parks and cemeteries. I often wonder if there's a kit buried in those woods. You were fast, Israel, but I was faster, and I'm glad we didn't officially meet. In Wondery's Generation Y podcast, hosts and true crime fanatics Justin and Aaron explore hundreds of unsolved murders and conspiracy theories. They dig through the evidence, give their perspective, and bring the hard questions. No case too big or too small, whether it's the Golden State Killer or a small town story. Take for instance the case of Linda Sturmer, which is the episode I just listened to. In 2007, a fire broke out at the family home and Linda's husband Todd was found dead on the lawn. Justin and Aaron take you through the entire case point by point, breaking it down in an easy to understand style, which is why I love the show so much. And get this, if you take a quick scroll through the Generation Y feed, you'll see over 400 episodes just waiting to be heard. That's why I subscribed, and you should too. If you're ready to kick your true crime obsession into overdrive, subscribe to Wondery's The Generation Y Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Wondery, feel the story. Now back to the show. And finally, our title story coming to us from Reddit user Wolf Dream. Let's take a trip to the slaughter yard. Performing this experience is Nicole Goodnight. I was a little over two years old and just starting to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story around three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until Judgment Day or something like this. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman who always talks way too loud was literally whispering by the end of it. And she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely and still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad I can't remember it too. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, Victor. I'm using an alias. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to town from there. My mom said the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean house, ugly house, don't like, scary house, mama, don't like. My mom says this behavior was very out of character for me, but... I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle AF and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house until recently, before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in and caused a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young, broke parents got a very cheap rent agreement gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level to fix. Either way, the landlord was adamant that the room was off-limits, and my parents always respected that. 
I would have looked, 100%. (laughs) I know all this because I heard stories about the creepy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it, and both my parents have told me it gave them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix boss. She was hanging laundry and I was rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, boss started going apeshit from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two running towards my mom, then turning and running back towards the pond, barking frantically the whole time. My mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off towards the water, full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Thank you, pupper. Love you. Although my mom was confused how I got so far so fast and how I got into the center of the pond since it was over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen for us crying or fussing while cooking. My mom said no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us, Victor's still sleeping, every baby gate is still shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search reveals, I'm not in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning causes my mom to rush outside to see what he's trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off towards the right away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother, wait for her to catch up a little before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from our neighbors. He led her to a thick strand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking out from a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in, at least, one of a few thick strands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, just standing. She rushed over to me and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was here, how I got there, etc. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking very young, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said I told her, with that serious look only small children can give, that the children brought me here. Shotting her pants at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, and walk right back past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, she demanded to know what children and where the hell are they now. I looked at her, dead serious, and told her the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs and that I didn't see them there anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with a serious expression, and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me, so she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road and in this place in under 15 minutes. I was only two, and as slow, as clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. 
Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but I haven't yet decided I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever the fuck those things were, I really don't think they were children. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and review. Subscribe wherever you're listening right now so you never miss an episode. Please support our sponsors. By doing so, you allow us to offer this show for free. Musical score by Carl Casey at White Bat Audio, Co.ag, and Kevin Hartnell. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all.